Hello, my name is Ben Tanzer, and my favorite thing is The Basketball Diaries. The book. The movie's fine, but the book. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. I am joined tonight by, I'm going to go to his bio, Emmy Award winning coach, creative strategist, podcaster, writer, teacher, and social worker who has been helping nonprofits, publishers, authors, and small business and career changers tell their stories for 20 years. Author Ben Tanzer is a podcast host. He is one of the first people in Chicago that I knew with a podcast. His podcast called This Podcast Will Change Your Life was launched in February of 2010. So he is up there over 13 years of podcasting, coming up on your 14th anniversary, if I'm counting correctly. And his new novel, The Missing, will be released on March 21st, 2024. And so that is the occasion that brings us together tonight. Ben, how are you doing? Well, I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start with that. And I appreciate you having me. And yes, it's not just that podcast has been around forever, which is wild. We have known each other forever through, I believe, our mutual friend, Amy Guth. So shout out to the Guth. But we go pretty far back. So I'm great. And honestly, very happy to see you. That's always fun to me. I don't know if I've ever seen you and not smiled. So I want to thank you for that. It's so good to be together. Yeah, I think it was in the days of the Pilcrow Lit Fest. Yes. Wow. Wow. That was a thing. That was a really beautiful thing. I'm sorry. I don't know how anything lasts anyway, but I'm glad that happened while it happened and the writers you and Amy brought in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really a stellar event. It was great. It was such a fun time. And it is the like catalyst for why I have so many authors on my podcast today, because Jen Mokoski came that year. Mm -hmm. We've been Facebook friends ever since. And I saw she had a new book coming out. And I was like, hey, do you want to come on my podcast? So she came on my podcast to promote her book and, and talk about abandoned sanatoriums. Wow. Is that her favorite yeah. thing? Real spooky. Yeah. Okay. Can't compete with that, but I'm glad to hear it. And she's a yeah. terrific writer. And then her publicist was like, oh, you talk to authors? And essentially, her publicist has my Calendly link and can book her authors whenever. <laughs> Very, very nice. So it all goes back to Pilcro. So you have a new book coming out and you got a wonderful, very warm review from the, is it Kirkus or Kirkus? It's Kirkus Reviews. Yeah. It's the first time I can say unequivocally or maybe it's unabashedly, but they've never reviewed one of my books before. So it's taken 20 plus years. So it was very humbling. And I'm both happy and embarrassed to say I got a little emotional when I got the email. Yeah. I was kind of shocked. I was glad I was sitting by myself at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about this book. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we should know for those listening, if they care, this is my first thing in seven years. So I've been on an extensive, not entirely planned break between books. So Mm -hmm. it's also just very exciting to be back out, even in my old man brain. But uh, this book follows a marriage over six months or so. Each chapter flips between the point of view of the husband or wife, the protagonists, and the sort of catalyzing, or I don't want to say triggering, the sort of event that drives this book is that their teenage daughter runs away Mm. and does not want to be seen or heard and doesn't want them to know where she is and has left with like a slightly older boyfriend. Yeah. So I've said this already, I'll probably say it a thousand times. It seemed important to me that None of it's criminal. So people don't care quite as much as the parents care. They Mm -hmm. care a lot. But what they also care about is, what did we do? Why don't we better understand this? Why doesn't she want to talk to us? What could we have done differently? And you don't have those answers when the person isn't there to answer your questions. Right. How did this idea of this story catch you? I believe there are sort of three pieces to this that I will not belabor any of the three. One. I had heard an interview or a story maybe on This American, I'm pretty sure it was This American Life. I should probably know that for a fact. A long time ago where a mother talked about this, that both of her daughters just left one day and that was the, and she couldn't find them and they didn't want to be found and there was nothing nefarious. 
they were just like done being around her. So I could never quite shake that. So that was one piece. Yeah. I had written a book, a YA book, young adult book that didn't get any traction. And so that was sitting on a shelf and I thought there's a lot of rich material in it. Mm -hmm. Then I was asked to pitch a book to my now agent and I knew that YA book wasn't it because clearly nobody else had been interested. Yeah. Simultaneously, I had been interested in trying to write about a long running marriage. I didn't know what to say about it. So I told the agent, I brought them together and I said, oh, I got this whole story about a girl and their daughter and she'll be in the middle of it. And then I said, she'll run away and this will happen and that'll happen. Then she went, pause. She said, write a book about what happens when your kid runs away. All of those points are interesting. Mm -hmm. That's the hook. And as soon as she said that, and this is why I love brains and writing and whatever. As soon as she said, build a story around that, a book that didn't exist, I could automatically see it happening in my head. So where did that idea come from? I needed a pitch. I had a book I'd abandoned. I had the story in my head. And she said, that's a hook. And I thought, okay, go home and write that book, which is what I did. But that was almost six years ago. So it's been an interesting, okay. and as I said, somewhat unplanned journey along the way to get to you tonight. Yeah. Well, and there was COVID in those six years that I think was COVID. put a, a hurdle in some people's creative plans. Well, and so one of the things that's interesting, which I believe this makes me sound obnoxious, and I want to say it in the best way, because that's no way to sell books. but she went to market in February 2020. COVID hit in March 2020. Mm. And when it was clear COVID was going to last, and I do not want to minimize any element of the COVID discussion, I looked at Debbie, my wife, and I said, you know what? If COVID really continues like it looked like it's going to continue, she's not going to be able to sell this book. It's too grim. I didn't use that word. Sure. But what's funny is that over the last, you know, over the height of the pandemic, some of the rejections became beautifully written, too grim to buy during a pandemic. So sure. I could see that happening like Matrix style in slow motion, and then it happened. So yeah, that got in the way. But again, to say a pandemic gets in the way of your sales is horrible. Let's just say that that didn't help. And that's fine. I'd much rather save a bunch of lives and have a vaccine that works. So anyway, yeah. that slowed things down. And it caused me to change direction because the agent was like, no one's going to buy this right now. Do you want to shelve it? And I didn't want to shelve it. I knew she loved it, which made me think someone else is going to love it. And there'd been yeah. a publisher I had talked to before about it. And that's 713 Books. And so now we're back together. I asked for her blessing to revisit it with them. And they picked it up. And then that took another two years. So here we are, yeah. five or six years later. Amazing. So you had it written, done and dusted before oh my COVID God. started. It's been done, technically done since February of 2020. So okay. this is now about to be February 2024. I hadn't even reread it till last summer when the publisher said, hey, a couple of things I want you to take another look at before we go and make it final. And I hadn't even opened it. I didn't, and I want to say I didn't need to, but sure. nobody was asking for any of my thoughts. It was, will we sell this or won't we? Then it was, we'll revisit this in a year. So I just went on to work on other things. So yeah, it's been pretty interesting getting to know the book again. Wow. That's pretty wild. Right, because why? There's no reason to keep the file open and continue to tinker no. when it's done. No, and it's funny. I have a coaching client, and I, I hope now a friend if she's listening. And one of the things we've been talking about is a book she's ready to pitch. And just yesterday, she's like, "Do I keep tinkering?" And I thought, "No, I think it's time for you and I to figure out a path forward for it." Mm -hmm. Like at some point, right? There's no need to work on it. And then if someone loves it, so when Joanna and I, the agent. We did some revisions in December 2019, then January 2020. And she said, mm -hmm. this is it. This is the book. Great. Uh, so yeah, I didn't look at it again for three and a half years. Wow. Actually, can we talk a little bit about, well, no, let me, uh, my ADHD medicine is like wearing off and we both facilitated today. So I know like we're in a really interesting, both I think in an interesting mind space, having held space for other people all day. And now we're coming together to like have a conversation. How are you planning to celebrate the launch of the book? Are you going to do some in-person stuff? Are you touring? Are you doing virtual? What's the story? So this is interesting, too, because of the pandemic. I work with a lot of authors, and there was a couple of years stretch where nobody could read anywhere. And apparently, even though COVID's still here, that window is reopened. People can go places. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to say 
that I will be doing a reading on March 21st at Exile in Bookville, which is a terrific indie bookstore downtown Chicago in the Fine Arts Center. I hope everybody comes. But then I have a whole series of events after that, including, though I don't have the date in front of me, Bad Marketing, with our mutual friend, Lee Matthew Goldberg. He and I will be reading together at the bookseller here as well. And I'm honored to say that a couple of other places have shown interest. I'm going to go to New York City. I'm going to go to Philly, where my mom now lives. I'm going to Los Angeles. I just booked that. Outstanding. I, it's funny, right? I don't know that anybody cares if I come or not. I'm not saying that in a self-deprecating way. Like, I want that. We all have been indoors. Yeah. I haven't had a book come out. I thought, if these things can happen, I'm just going to ask people. So over two months, I'm probably going to do seven or eight readings in Chicago, across the Midwest, and then I'm going to bounce between both coasts as well. I love that. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited about it. It looks like it's all booked literally as of today. Nice. So Lee is a great transition because I also have had a lot of authors on because of you. (laughs) I don't want to pretend like you are not also responsible for half of the authors that come on. And I just, so in this facilitation I did for the last two days with my team at work, one of the things we talked about was we did a, like a one hour show and tell where everybody made one slide, like one or two pictures of what inspires them. Mm. And mine was a screenshot of my bookshop.org affiliate bookstore of authors I've had on the podcast. Oh, I love that. Because through you specifically, the authors that you've worked with and introduced me to, I've met so many people who published for the first time over the age of 50. Michael Karen, there's the woman in the RV in Florida whose name just is out of my brain right now. She was in her 70s, I think, when she published her first book. And do you want to talk a little bit about that retreat that you're a part of? Is that something you're still a part of? You go so to I'm like- not as involved because they're okay. a bit, I wouldn't say they're on hiatus. I think they're rebuilding, re-somethinging. Sure. But that was, and again, I'm probably going to find myself saying this a lot in the next couple of months. One of the very cool and blessed things I got to do the last several years particularly pre-pandemic, but even during, was I was involved with this really beautiful literary retreat center out in Vermont, When Words Count. And one of the things they did was they would host a contest where authors could pitch their books. But it wasn't just who's got the best book. You had to come with a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. You had to write the back cover copy, your own cover copy. And so I was invited to be a judge, which I loved. And Mm -hmm. apparently... So maybe you've known this because we know each other for a long time. I have a massive ego. I was not fully aware of that. Um, <laughs> and I am also a good judge. I really enjoy it. And, you know, I like you and I, one thing I think we have in common is a sort of love of strategy, right? Mm-hmm. So no matter what job I'm doing, I think of myself as on helping people think strategically and helping them be the best storytellers they can be. So as a judge, that was really fun. One of the things that spun off of that was that the people in charge, along with the publishers they were working with, for the winners and other people who got their books picked up was they wanted to offer a strategic marketing slash publicity Mm -hmm. person. So a number of people either won my services or were willing to pay for that extra help. And so then you got to meet a bunch of those people. You would love them. So right. Michael Karen, Elizabeth Splain, I believe. Yes. The opera singer. Yeah. And he's right. The opera singer. I know. So, you know, it's funny. And if any of them are listening, like I love writers. So that's always been one of my jams. And I always wanted to meet writers. Mm -hmm. Even before I ever thought about trying to become one, it just was a fascination for me. What's been interesting about that job and then other things like meeting Lee, who doesn't come out of that opportunity, but we formed another whole partnership was just that, you know, writers needed help and they needed someone to work with them. And it's such a gift. Like it would be a gift even if they weren't cool. But then you meet them and you're like, oh, you guys are awesome. Yeah, I've become Facebook friends with a number of your authors. And I'm like, I just love keeping up with them. They're all so lovely. They really are. And then you think, wow, they're authors. They're lovely humans. I'm happy to see them. Mm -hmm. I also get to pay the bills. I get to talk books. Like the last couple of years have been hard for people in all the ways we all know. And, you know, you've known me a long time. I got fired from a really big job. Set, well, big for me. I always want to add that coda. It was big for me and I loved it. And whether it was time to move on or not, they decided to move I me mean, on. I mean, I think within a year of each other, we both were laid off of. That's right. Pretty, that is I, that close together. Yeah. So, you know. February, February 2018 is when so I. I believe I, 
I'm May of 2017. So yeah. I'll be coming up on literally on seven years. So or maybe I'm May of 2016. I'll have to look at my LinkedIn page. So maybe it's coming up on eight years, which is really scary because I definitely wasn't middle aged when I lost that job. However, and you know, I don't want to pretend I don't care about it. It's just to say all these other things have emerged in that mm-hmm. window. And I'm sure I'm not totally have found a place of equanimity about losing my job like I did. Yeah. However, I had to go rebuild myself and, you know, things came up and people were kind to me and there are things I'm good at. And it did force me to think, you did things you weren't enjoying. Why do things you don't enjoy? Let's try to figure this out. Yeah. Because I got laid off two days before I was going to London on vacation. And they were like, go to London, have a great time, come back and get a job. And it was like, Fuck you very much for telling me how to enjoy my vacation. Oh, like that's we're not doing your... you a favor. You, we're you doing don't a do fa- someone a favor when you fire them or lay them off, and right. especially when they're not cool. Like I can say, I this is not bitter because it's their right. And I've never thought bosses you can fire anyone. I mean, yeah. I don't know how legally, but fire me. I you know I I didn't lose my job because of poor performance, but they treated it so shabbily, and it's like hey. Go do the things you wanted to do. I'm like, I will. And you couldn't have done this differently. You need to escort me out of the office. I've been here for 17 years. I've raised, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think I've earned the right to walk out at five o'clock. Yeah. Maybe. Oh. And come back tomorrow. (laughs) They took my peers, all of my peers, to the big conference room and on a fake meeting. So they wouldn't see me leave and told and told them not to talk to me. And only two people ever talked to me after I lost my job. Only one person like stayed a friend and continued to talk to me until I saw everyone at the funeral this winter. That was the first time. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we've kept up with your cancer. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, none of you. Nobody. I was there for seven years. And that brutal realization that they weren't these were in most cases, not real friendships like that. Everybody was like, oh, I guess we just drop her brutal and you really have to like rebuild your identity and the good news is on this side of it i have a full-time job now and it is not my like work is not my identity anymore right i have this podcast Mm -hmm. i have my synagogue i have my family i have my wonderful gossipy building that i live in all of which is more important than work right it's funny it's interesting hearing you because i have always been someone who embraces or have tried to consciously embrace multiple identities. So Uh I think a little different than you, work wasn't my identity, but I took it very seriously. Yeah. And the only grounds that I'm aware of was the new leadership didn't want me around anymore. And again, I think that's okay, right? Yeah. And I really value reinvention. I mean, there's a lot of things I'm not great at, and there are things I wish I was more self-aware about as a human, you know, in the Uh universe. But- I certainly never shy away from reinvention. So, okay, we'll go do that. But it takes time. And you do have to reap to your point, even if it becomes a positive, you're rebuilding something that takes time and it takes work and it's discouraging and you have bad days. I mean, all of that applies no matter what you're doing, but it really applies when you're like, oh, wow, there's no net anymore. They took my net. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a wild time, but I put up a shingle as did you. Yeah. Although I'll say when I I was very upfront with people that like my goal of freelancing was a new full time job. And I constantly told people that I wasn't shy about it. Like I considered every freelance engagement a long term interview because I work better than I interview. Mm. I'm a ter- I have never gotten a job from an interview. Well, that's so interesting. I o- only get jobs from working. See, so your audience may listen to this and think, wow, that guy is a terrible interview and I will embrace that. <laughs> I think I'm a very good interview and I'm fairly good, sometimes great on the job. Uh, however, I definitely, it's just, I love that we're having this conversation. I took the opposite approach. I would tell people if they asked, oh no, I'm not looking for anything full time. Mm-hmm. If that's what you need, then we can do, e- and this is what I got much better at. Yeah. We can do each other a favor. You don't have to bring me in. You won't if you won't hurt my and the other thing is it is hard to hurt my feelings. I understand there's a lot of stuff going on. So but it is funny. I was doing the opposite. What's interesting is I can see myself now after all now it's a bunch of years apparently. Mm-hmm. I could easily shift back into what you're describing. You know, I was at a <laughs> we went on a trip, my wife and I, 
for our one of our anniversaries. And I was having a drink and this older guy just started talking to me, which is really funny because people weren't really talking to us on this trip. And I thought, okay, we're together. We'll, we'll be fine. I, I don't know what energy we were giving off. Uh, probably, <laughs> hey, that guy lost his job two years ago and they can't justify going on a trip yet. That was probably it. Yeah. This guy was like, hey, man, what's your story? And I, we had a, a version of this conversation, but I was still in reinvention mode. He's like, I was there. I was there 15 years ago. So mm-hmm. maybe this guy was 65. And he said, I was there, man. And, you know, I worked it out. And he looked at me and I wasn't asking for this, though. I'm a sucker for dad figures. And he's like, you'll work it out. And I have to admit, I knew I would. That's the one confidence I always carry. Yeah. But I really appreciated it. And he said, I worked it out and I did it for 15, whatever it was. Maybe I was you 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. He's like, I did it for 15 years. He goes, then, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the companies I was helping out said, do you want to be the gray beard here? You know, 60% time, make the decision, supervise people, like let us not be in the office anymore. We built something. You don't have to get your hands dirty. You know, like you've earned the chance just to be the person. Yeah. He goes, so now I'm sort of full time again. I mean, he wasn't, but he felt like he was. And he was so happy. And he's got vacation time again and health benefits. And I thought, okay, let's figure out a way to work back towards that. Mm-hmm. You know, somewhere like when I'm 60 or in my 60s, let's find someone who needs someone like me. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna go full cycle. I believe it. And I was always an office person. I love offices. I love it. I don't love I want to get back to commuting on the CTA. I miss the CTA so bad. Mm-hmm. I got a car in August of 2020. Whoa. Yeah. Before the before the price of used cars went banana pants, I got one. And the CT I mean, the CTA fell apart during COVID under Lightfoot. Johnson hasn't hasn't magically rebuilt it in the last 6 months. But once the CTA is back up and running, I look forward to like getting on the train and like just zoning out and getting some good space out time back in my life. Yeah. So I have been using it. I don't have to use it like we used to use it. Mm -hmm. It is, I have to say, and my wife and I lived in New York in the 90s. So that's a reference point. It is sketchier and dirtier and sadder. I mean, I really want to stress it's sadder because people don't have places to live or go to work whatever that is. And, you know, I have all the empathy in the world about that. So it does make the CTA more of a bummer, which makes me even more privileged. However, to your point, I still need to use it. I still teach in the South Loop and Mm -hmm. sometimes I walk home at night, but I still love being on trains and buses. It's just a different thing, as you're saying. And that part is weird. If you think about being on the bus or the train 10 years ago or 15 years ago, There was a weird, awesome community vibe. And, you know, I grew up in a somewhat small town, so my parents are both from New York City. And as soon as I got exposed to public transportation, I definitely lost my mind a little bit. I thought, this is a real thing. This is incredible. And I've never been able to shake it. Like, stuff like that, you know, graffiti, trains, crowds, you don't get that when you grow up in small towns. I mean, I can't get enough of all that. I don't even mind being crammed on the train now, and there's no way... With COVID still around, that's a good thing. But luckily, the trains aren't crowded like they were because folks like yourself are like, I'll wait. Your new novel is The Missing, release date March 21st, 2024. I'm sure available for pre-order now. I'm not sure about that, but maybe by the time this drops, yeah, I don't think there's a link I can send people to yet, which okay. is, is weird. But I think as soon as you Google it, it does come up. That's good. I think pre-order soon. Let's say soon, really soon. I bet pre-orders will be available by the time this episode comes out. Yes, I'm I'm sure of that. We've yeah. been doing a ton of discussion around the very final, let's go get this printed and make it available things. That's happening right now. Awesome. So Ben, the book is what gave us the occasion to get together tonight, but we're also here to talk about one of your favorite things. And what are we going to talk about or where are we going to start? Ah, you said I couldn't talk about how much you're one of my favorites. So I had to come up with something else because that's not an appropriate topic. I understand. (laughs) Interview you about me. It's weird. Don't you love the sound of that? I mean, (laughs) I do want to say, as we do this transition, we talked about it and joked about the top of the cowl, but you know, you're one, and there's a handful of you, but Amy Guth, our earliest connection, yep. you know, you are one of the first 
I'm going to say this, and I can say this unequivocally. You're one of the first lit people. Well, you're not necessarily a lit person, but you were then. Mm-hmm. You were one of the first lit people I ever met, so you're very near and dear to me. And what I can absolutely say, and I only did my best to aspire to how I think about you, you know, you're one of the first social media people I ever met, maybe the first. And some people say that about me, which sounds very humble braggy, but you know, I get that. Yeah. I always reference you, whether the people know you or not. I say, it is true. I understood there was some potential there. Yeah. But if you've never talked to Leah Jones about this, you don't actually understand how long this has been happening. I mean, I remember distinctly one of the reasons you were involved with Bill Brow was your social media mm-hmm. knowledge, but also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you were working with like indie bands. Like you were right there at the, right? I'm not making yeah, that up. Yeah, you're not you're making not it up. I worked with rabbis and rock stars. See, so look yeah. at rabbis, rock stars, and in my case, the rubbish. So I'm I'm glad to round <laughs> out that alliteration, but those are my associations with you. Yeah. And you know, I aspired to some of the stuff I understood you to be figuring out. Look, we've dovetailed several times over the last 20 yeah. years. It's a thrill for me. And now we're here. And yes, we're going to talk about favorite things besides you. What we talked about, potentially talking about, is possibly one of the greatest loves of my life, which I say with all due respect to the people I live with and, um, you know, Jim, but uh, we, which we could also talk about Jim, but I was going to talk about, or at least reference the book, The Basketball Diaries, which Great. You know, profoundly impacted me, impacted my adolescent brain. I know one of the reasons I'm a writer is because of that book. But I think one of the reasons I'm a lot of things is because of that book, as well as my friend, big shout out to Adam Lawrence, if he's listening. He handed me that book. It's kind of like someone hands you, I don't know, what would they hand you? They're like, this is going to change your life. He didn't Uh say that. And here I am being on brand, but he might as well have. And so that book really had a profound effect to me. And I'm always amazed how few people have read it. It seems impossible to me. Yeah. Who is the author? So the author is Jim Carroll. He passed away. It could easily be 10 years now. I, I'm very, very poor with dates. Okay. But he wrote that book, and it is a nonfiction. I don't know what it is, but it is a nonfiction stretch of his life that, yes, he took from his diaries. But uh, he was a New York author, high school basketball star, junkie, prostitute, God, who knew everybody and got that book published. And then it landed in my lap when I was like 12 or 13. Wow. So I'm sorry, you said Adam Lawrence? Big shout out to him. Yeah. So he and I grew up together. So he read it first and was like, dude, you got to read this. Yes. And I, you know, it's funny. I think I I was actually interviewing him for another project the other day because I'm never letting him go. I think I failed to ask him how it came to him, but he was interesting. He had sort of younger parents Mm -hmm. and then they had younger siblings. And I think he, more unlike me, had people who were like feeding him cool stuff. So. I always say he introduced me to the Ramones, he introduced me to the Basketball Diaries, and he introduced me to Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's a pretty solid trifecta. Yeah, right? All of which I sort of knew existed, but he made sure I had the actual experience. So yeah, I I think he just knew things and he knew people. And it wasn't like he was an only child. Like sometimes you'll say, oh, my older brother or my older sister. I just think he had uncles and he was curious and you know, we grew up, as I mentioned, in this small town. I never thought about leaving. Not that I ever thought about staying, mm-hmm. which probably captures a lot of how I exist in the universe. But recently <laughs> when I talked to him, he was like, oh, dude, I couldn't wait to get out. So, mm. you know, someone who can't wait to get out, they are consuming cool shit. And he yeah. was doing that was ever since we were children. So when you read it for the first time, what do you remember about the experience of your first read through? Well, so one, I didn't have this language. My brain literally exploded. I remember that. I will say, this is not deep enough almost. I know I'd never, and I was a voracious reader. So even getting like an adult book at 12, I mean, I had been reading anything I could get my hands on for years. The rules for Gen X reading adult books were non We read everything. We had full access to everything in the library, everything on our parents' shelves. You know, there was that one with the flowers in the attic. Like there were so many books that were possibly inappropriate. I'm not going to say inappropriate. If you could get your hands on it, you could read it if you were Generation X. And that was fabulous. I I say this with love, you know, because my mom and I are tight. I don't even know that I was supervised after first grade. Like 
It's not just that I could read anything. I could literally almost do anything from a very early age. So having a book like that land on my lap, you know, one of the things my wife and I joke about, if we have one of the things we have in common is that our respective mothers wanted to see Saturday Night Fever, which mm-hmm. was not appropriate at our age. And we both went with our moms so they could be sure to see it. And my mom never even thought twice about those things. So yes, we had access to everything. And by the way, I'm going to do a shout out to your shout out. Flowers in the Attic, I consider to be one of my all time favorite books. Really? Oh my gosh. I have read Flowers in the Attic no less than 25 to 50. Wow. Easily. I might even still have my original copy. I love that book. So somebody was reading it at the bus stop Mm -hmm. on the way to middle school. And I mean, I just had to read everything then. And she wasn't really reading it. She was just kind of holding it. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, what is that book? I don't know why, I guess, because it was literally a book. That's all I needed. And I don't think I had any friends back then. So I was probably very attached to books, even more so. But I said, hey, what's that book? And she said, oh, it's one of my mom's books. And I asked her if I could read it on the bus on the way to school. And she definitely gave me a look like, what the fuck? Like, (laughs) freak. Um, So it must have been younger than middle school. But I read the book on the bus, let's say seventh grade. And when we got to the school, I had read like 25 or 30 pages, like was jamming. And she's like, how did you read so much? And I was like, I think I'm losing my mind. And then at the end of the school day, I said, it was a Friday. I remember that I said, do you think your mother would let me take this for the weekend? She's like, you want to take my book home? And I said to her, are you going to read it? And she said, no. I go, I will return it fully read by Monday morning. And I did. Yeah. And then I bought a copy and then I read the whole series. So just want to give that as a shout out. Wow. Okay. Um, So Basketball Diaries with all of its adult themes is not coming to you as your first book with adult themes in it. Oh, no. That started probably in first or second grade. As soon as I could sound out big words, it was over. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting point you make about Basketball Diaries, because my second point would have been, one, mind blown, two, and there's two parts to this, because now I'm older, right? But it was. it's not just that it was adult-themed, which it clearly was, but what he was engaged in wasn't even something I could comprehend. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I don't want to sound inappropriate. Please cut me off at any point. But like, there's so much sex, like so much sex. And there's so much drugs and there's so much violence. And he's casually prostituting, but also casually being sexually abused. And I'm not making light of that. Like, right. he's making light of these things. I don't know how he felt about them. And, you know, it's interesting to read it and then read it again. So a couple of years ago, I was invited to write an essay about it. Mm-hmm. And I was now 40, right? not 13, though, again, like Flowers in the Attic, I've probably read Basketball Diaries at least 25 times, probably more. But I hadn't read it in about 15 years. Okay. Now I'm reading it as an adult with children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that shocked me was it was just as graphic as I remembered. But all of a sudden, I realized that the character is only like 14. That didn't register when I read it. So what's just interesting is I was only like two years younger than the protagonist. So yeah. he didn't just live in another world. I mean, we could have been this in the same place as we were not uh, in different decades. But I'm just sharing it because it was adult themes, but he was living them at an age barely As, as a child. Than. I mean, it's, it's wild to me. It is, it's still wild. And I want to say the third thing I would say, and this is the thing that's, I think, most profound. Yes, sex, drugs. He's hanging out with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who back then is Lou Cinder, because they're both high school basketball stars. Mm-hmm. He's prostituting himself. He's taking drugs, all that, all of that. But this is the part I always articulate the worst. The book is so live wire. The book has so much energy. And the thing that really blew me away was getting sucked in. And again, this is where I wish I sounded super eloquent or something was getting sucked into the rhythm of that book. And it took me a long time to realize two things. And there's another book I've been working on where I tried to capture some of this. I think I spent the rest of my life trying to feel like that, you know. Feel the way you felt reading it. Yeah, and how he felt. Like, you're always on. Like, Mm -hmm. you're always on. You're And not on, like, you're bouncing off the wall, so I am like that. More on, like, every day is a chance for something amazing to happen. Mm-hmm. You leave the house. If you take chances, if you go on trips, if you do things that are a little dangerous and outside your comfort zone and on and on and on, like, there's a chance for, like, such pleasure and joy. And I want to say, I made this connection recently. My mom, who was the breadwinner when we were kids, who's just a genius, I mean, graduated from high school at 15, 
I mean, she's incredible. She's a real superwoman to me. She's all about joy too and pleasure. Like Mm -hmm. you can stop and get a good drink somewhere. If you can stop at a restaurant you've never heard of and eat their specialty, she will do that. Nice. And you know, in a way that has nothing to do with the basketball diaries, but it has everything to do with it because it's all about how do I get the most pleasure out of every moment and how do I take care of myself, you know? And so I think as a life, as a way to live, I'm fascinated by that. But then of course I've tried to, we're not going to talk about writing because we both agreed that's not interesting enough. No, let me say it is very interesting. I am just, I am running out of interesting questions to ask about uh, writing. Okay, good, good. No, I just so, want to put you on the spot. What I want to say is that I didn't read a book like that or the millions of books I've read and think, God damn it, I'm going to be a writer. Like that was not my thing. I mean, I wish it was mm-hmm. or it could have been, but it wasn't. It was just how do I read all the books? Yeah. And then how do I ever meet writers? Which then full circle back to where we're talking about me working with writers. But what I want to share is once I started writing, it it took me probably five or 10 years to realize I was trying to figure out, among other things, how he did that with the basketball diaries. Mm-hmm. How does every sentence feel like an explosion? Because that's what it felt like when I yeah. and when I reread it a couple of years ago, it's still like 75% that. Some of the second half is a little draggy because he's a little druggy and he's in jail. But man, the language, all of it, Ugh, New York City in the 60s. I yeah. mean, oh my God. So anyway, the point there is how do you write like that? How do, how do I write at least to make myself feel like that when I'm right. reading? Whether the reader does or not, though, of course, I'd be thrilled if that happens. Yeah. How do you write firecrackers on every page? Yes, exactly. Yeah. How do you do that? You know, huh. and so that's awesome to me. That's why. And that's one of the main reasons I love that book, because I feel so fucking alive. Excuse my language. Are we allowed to swear? In you are show? allowed to swear. Yes. Okay, I want to be careful. But I feel so alive every time I pick it up. Hmm. And uh, he was he was so alive. You know, then you hear, oh, we had a brief affair with Patty Smith. You're like, of course he did. He hung out with, you know, Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg. And you're like, obviously he did. Because yeah. what else was he going to do? So anyway. That's it. That's why I love that book. It's about feeling something so intensely. Yeah. And now I said, like, you're an expert in yourself, not in the book. But did Spike Lee make a movie out of it? No. So it's Was funny. There... I don't know who made the movie. There is a movie. There is a movie. Leonardo okay. DiCaprio, a very young Leonardo DiCaprio's in it. Oh. And a very young Mark Wahlberg, one of his first roles. Wow. I'm not sure okay. who the director was. People tend to like the movie and don't even know about the book. I know Jim Carroll said it's a fine movie, but it's got nothing to do with my book. So yeah. I don't think he loved it, but it's worth seeing. And it, look, if you want to see an 18-year-old, absolutely gorgeous Leo DiCaprio, it may be worth it just for that. But there is a movie. It was made by some New Yorker. I have no idea. Okay, Because I was conflating it at first before you started describing the book. Well, no, you said the author's name. And I was like, okay, that's not the one I'm thinking about. There's a Native American writer who published a book in the 90s that I was thinking was Basketball Diaries, but it was like a basketball, like on the reservation book. That I, I remember that book. Wow. What was that called? So I'm not going to come up with it. Wait, Sacred Hoops? That might be it. No, no. So Sacred Hoops was the coach of the Bulls. That was his leadership book. Okay. Then I, then I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But there's also an author who's beautiful writer. I haven't read enough of him. John Edgar Weidman. I think I'm pronouncing that possibly correct. He wrote a book about basketball or basketball is one of the central organizing the themes. That was in the 90s. That's maybe not what you're thinking about. That book is beautiful. He's a great writer. You are tapping into something that basketball is a wonderful way to talk Mm -hmm. about life and to write about it. And if it's just one of your jams, which is not no pun intended then I do think it's really fertile to talk about why that's important to you. It's such a visceral game. And so, and athletics are visceral. And I was an athlete, you know, so I think of writing like I used to think about sports, right? I replaced one with the other. Yeah. So I will verify Sacred Hoops is by Phil Jackson, who was the Bulls coach. That is Sacred Hoops. Yep. But it's not his, I don't think it's his leadership book. This is Spiritual Lessons of Hardwood. And then I think he had a different, book that was his leadership book that I did have to read in college. People did require us to read that. I think a client yeah. required me to read the book you're referring to. People love that book. There was a minute when the Bulls were kings of the world, and very appropriately so, 
that anything Phil Jackson wrote, it was just presumed you had to consume it and you'd, you'd understand how everything works. Yeah. But it's interesting what you're saying about how you replaced sports with writing. So by the time this episode comes out, my interview with Paul Shear will have come out. And his favorite thing was the LA Clippers. Mm. And he was talking about he loves basketball because he loves the drama that he kind of equated being a fan of a basketball team to being a fan of like reality TV of the Bravo universe of like once the more, you know, the stories of the players and, and you, then you know why they're throwing shade at each other, but also specifically building traditions with his sons of going to basketball games and building those memories and those traditions of attending sporting events together. Yep. So I have a lot of love for the Clippers. I am a New Yorker. His feeling about the Clippers is probably very similar. And this has waned in the last couple of years as I've gotten old. But that's how I felt about the Knicks mm-hmm. all through the 90s and into the early part of the century. Well, well into this new century. And what's funny about that, two parts. One, I think if you're a Gen X, our age, then when you were 18 or 19, that's when the NBA really took off. That's when yep. Magic and Larry Bird, they were followed by Isaiah, then Jordan. So the game itself elevated. I was obsessed with the Knicks for a long time. And one of the funny things about that is it's so much drama for a variety of reasons, but one main reason, they couldn't get past the Bulls. So I am not a New Yorker who hates the Bulls. I love the Bulls. We Uh lived here, second three titles. However, I had to watch the Knicks in the very glorious Patrick Ewing go down in flames year after year after year. And, And it's brutal. It's brutal watching something you love lose over and over again and you can't even totally believe in them like if you're a Knicks fan and you say oh but that when John Starks got that dunk over Pippen in the playoffs which was glorious someone will say a Chicagoan will always say oh you New Yorkers are so sad you've built your whole memory and love around one play whereas we won three titles but you know Mm -hmm. we need that play we need that play because otherwise we got nothing I was telling the story earlier this week so I grew up in Indiana Pacers. So those Pacers Knicks like runs were pretty amazing too in the in the mid nineties. Oh my Reggie, god! We had Reggie Miller. So so it was it was a great fun time to be a fan of basketball. It was, and look, you know, you mentioned Spike Lee, so let's go full circle. Reggie Miller gets what? How many points was that in seven seconds or seven points in three seconds? Oh, I what don't remember Knicks? that. Yeah, sorry. So there's a <laughs> legendary game where Reggie Miller, who I have a lot of love for, he scored an unbelievable amount of points. Eight points in nine seconds. Thank you. It's incredible. But so then after he hits that, I believe it's the final basket, Mm -hmm. he looks over at Spike Lee and he does the choke sign because Spike loved the so much. And it's incredible. Even Spike had to enjoy it. And he was clearly dying inside a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it was this game in particular, but it's 1995, May of 95. It was my convocation. I graduated in 95. And I'll just tell the story two weeks in a row on my podcast because it's my podcast and it's a great story. The Knicks Pacers were playing the night of our, our convocation. So that's the night that you get your scholarships and, and awards in senior year mm-hmm. in my school. My dad got a small radio with a headset, sat in the front row and would be like, Pacers up two points, down two points. And he hand, did hand signals the whole convocation for Pacers Knicks. And eventually everyone on stage figured out what my dad was doing and was just watching him to get the score of the Knicks Pacers game. And then it ends and they all these boys, like popular boys who did not care about me, crowded around my dad to like hear the last moments of the game. It was like that is a very Indiana basketball wow. memory. That is your Hoosiers. That's yeah. your Hoosiers. Your dad. Yeah, it's funny. He reminds me, it would have been around at the same time, probably later, when the Jets somehow inexplicably qualified for the playoffs in football. <laughs> and at my older nephew's bar mitzvah, everybody, all the wait staff and a bunch of dads and people like me heard there was a TV like in the kitchen behind mm-hmm. wherever the party was. And we all went to watch the Jets. I don't know who they upset. But they won this enormous game and they hadn't won a playoff game. And I'm sure you can figure this out very quickly. But we were all like, nobody could breathe. Yeah. And there was a whole party going on 
And yes, somebody was becoming a man. However, however, yeah, the Jets were playing. I'm not even a Jets fan, but we were in New York for the bar mitzvah, and everybody was sucked in. As I said, the wait staff, the parents, the dads, everybody who cared about football, which is a lot of people on Long Island, and yeah. uh, we all went and watched that game, and it was glorious. I mean, it was glorious. Yeah, yeah. I went again a wedding weekend. Like we were all staying at a Jewish summer camp. It was the Blackhawks. It was, I think, the, one of the years they won the Stanley Cup. Groom was a huge Blackhawks fan. And so rehearsal dinner, there was a TV somewhere so people could watch the game because they weren't going to miss it. You know, it raises really interesting questions, especially on a show called, you know, about, about favorites and finding favorites, where your priorities lie. It's important to get married if that's your thing. It's important to get bar mitzvah if you want to be a man but or have a convocation. But if the Pacers are playing or the Knicks or the Jets, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't ignore that, can you? Right. You can't. You won't. No. I won't. Your dad won't. No. <laughs> so back to the book. Oh, yeah. Did you ever specifically introduce it to your kids? Was there a moment where you said this book means so much to me or did it, was it just on the bookshelf and if they find it, they find it? So that is an awesome question. And the answer is I couldn't bear for them just to find it. I didn't think my older son, Miles, shout out to the great Miles, would enjoy it or necessarily read it. He's finally reading a lot, which of course is giving me all sorts of uh, spilkies. Is that the right word? Toss out mm -hmm. a Yiddish word crowd. My younger one, Noah, has started reading quite a bit. I knew he would love it. And so in his case, I just thought, what's the right time? Kind of like the first time he and I watched Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. I thought it's got to be the right time. Because if he rejects this, I will literally crumble into dust. Yeah. So yes. Noah, I felt like he was ready for it. And I handed it to him. And he loved it. And he also said, how could you hand me that book? And I said, <laughs> mission accomplished. Right. Nice. No, but no child should read that book. No, not even a 13 or 14, whatever age he was. But no, he was really enamored with it. And it made me quite happy. He was less happy when I had him watch. There is a tie in here in my head, the movie After Hours, which we could have also talked about, mm -hmm. which I'm obsessed with, which I've been writing about for a different project. But I needed him to watch it with me one time. Yeah. He's sort of my Scorsese go to in the house. And afterward, he said, so that's what you've been talking about? He goes, that made me very uncomfortable. And I thought, yes, yes, it did. I don't even have to ask you why. Hmm. So basketball diary, similar. You gave me a proper, you've possibly ruined my life. I'm definitely uncomfortable. <laughs> Amazing. And what about giving it to friends or like your wife or other girlfriends? Yeah, you know, it's funny. There's probably a really good word for this. I don't know what it is. I'm definitely not that kind of giver. I don't know what to call that. Like. I don't presume anybody will like anything I like, not because I think I'm so special. I know I'm reading things and watching things that other people like, yeah. but I always presume people won't feel like that. So maybe I'm just worried about being disappointed. This is an interesting question we've stumbled into. So no, I actually don't do that. I mean, on occasion, if people ask me, what do I like? Yeah. I will say, I like this a lot. I'll let you know why. And I'm not sure you'll like it, but it had a profound effect on me. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't actually tend to push my thing. I hadn't really thought about that before. My experience is it's very hard for anyone to feel the excitement you feel about something. Sure. And so I may actually be sort of avoiding that. Mm. Wow. I'm going to have to muse on this after our, our call here. So no, I have not pushed that book very often. I will say, though. You've not been the Johnny Appleseed of Basketball no, Diaries. No, and I'm not opposed to it either. But no, I'm not. And I'm not like my friend Adam who's turned me on to so much stuff. Another shout out to Adam. I will say though, which is funny, I don't do that. However, I'm the opposite kind of person. Maybe I'm needier. We should explore this. If someone says they like the book, uh -huh. then I, I insist they have to stay friends with me indefinitely. <laughs> so that is true. I yeah. don't push the book on people. If someone else even casually references it, I'm not sure I say to them, you're stuck with me for the rest of your life, but that is how it okay. is. And I have a long list of those kinds of things, right? Like, if you like basketball diaries, if you like after hours, if you like do the right thing, and these are things that are not unpopular either. Right. If you drink gin, right? 
if there are things you do or did them during certain times, we'll just presume that you're stuck with me, which means you can leave any time. I'm totally cool with that, but I will not <laughs> leave you. We are now tethered and yep. you will have to break the court. Amazing. Yeah. What are your top three gens currently in rotation? Oh, okay. So big fan of Hendrix. Yep. I think Hendrix is number one right now. And if Mary Jo Caruso is listening, I want to give her a shout because she sent me a beautiful bottle or brought me a beautiful bottle of Hendrix when we did a gig together here in Chicago. And I love her. I would have loved her anyway, but that gin was a clincher. <laughs> so that was a work thing. But, you know, occasionally clients give me bottles of gin and I think, and you're also going to pay me? I mean, what a world we live in. <laughs> uh, so Hendrix and the whole fleet of the Hendrix. Uh, it's funny. I've recently rejected Bombay Sapphire, though I will still drink it. Okay. It fell out of the rotation. But what fell in, I can't explain why. Someone offered it to me and I was like, why have I been ignoring this Tanqueray? Which yeah. may be a cheap gin. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know why it was never a thing. So someone absolutely either insisted or just poured me one, and it was delightful. So Tanqueray is in the top three. Sapphire is out. And then I'm going to throw one out. You had a former colleague. I don't know what this guy's name was. He had come out of the spirits industry. He might have been a Wisconsin guy, but he turned me on to what's no longer quite a craft gin, because I think they sell it at Trader Joe's now, but uh, Death's Door. I love Death's Door. Death's Door is a very special thing. So I don't drink it as often as I used to. I don't drink anything as often as I used to. But also these other ones have climbed. But I feel like I have to stay attached to it. That was really the thing that fully pushed me into I'm a gin guy. So whatever that is. And again, it was someone you used to work with years ago. And we were at a dinner. And he said, this is one of the only restaurants that serves Death's Door in Chicago. I want you to try it. That was already a gin. I thought of myself as a preference person but uh yeah that put me over the top i remember having death store for the first time at new line tavern like on clinton yes that's and where i was maybe you were there that's where i have, was yeah it there was been... some guy some spirits guy who i think you worked with or had cross paths with yeah but that's where i had it so whether it we were daryl jersa yes daryl jersa who also worked on like the pomegranate liqueur and that's he was marketing that like pomegranate liqueur when I met him. And then yes. he Jersey. worked at Dig and then I took over his job at Dig. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. That's so how we were all together. He, yes. Okay. So he's the guy. I think I've only met him twice, but one yeah. of those times we were at that bar. Do they serve food there too? They do. Yes. Yes. We were having dinner and he said, you need to get a gin and tonic with Death's Door. And again, yeah. it was, again, I react very intensely to lots of things, but it was quite a wonderful experience. Yeah. Death's Door is the gin that made me a gin person. So Thank you. I think it solidified it. I already thought I was mm-hmm. one, and then after that, it was locked. So my origin story with, not origin story, the reason I didn't drink it until I had Death's Door, there was a summer where my mom's best friend, Ms. Lindsay, needed help taking out her juniper bushes. A Ooh. hot Indiana summer, late 80s, early 90s. And my sister and I had to like, it had to got to help her cut down her juniper bushes. And I didn't, you know, my, my dad is sober. I didn't know, I didn't know about alcohols. And then at some point I tried gin. And the first time I tried gin, it was not a top shelf gin. It was something that just tasted like a hot summer day, standing inside of a juniper bush, getting covered in scratches. And I was like, nope, no, thank you. Gin is not for me. And then I had Death's Door, which is not a gin, is not a juniper forward one. And then I realized that Hendrix was often easier to find. What do you think about Empress, the gin that turns purple? I don't think I've had that. But if it turns purple, I want in. Oh, it's it's very fun to mix cocktails with it. I want that. I, you yeah. know, I am so easily entertained and I'm so impressionable. And if you told me something turns purple, then I just want it. Great. That circles back to anything that's new and pleasurable. Count me in. So yeah, I'm in. Empress is it? Empress. Empress Jen. I'm going to have to It's a beautiful bottle. It's a cool color. And then depending on what you mix it with, it's just cool. And it is also delicious. I'm so in. And look, if someone listening to the show wants me to join them for their uh, book club and they pour gin drinks, let's do some purple gin drinks. I don't, I think it, 
it can only complement the reading, right? Absolutely. Maybe you can come up with a, if any of your readings are places that are allowed to serve alcohol, you could come up with a missing gin and tonic. Can we, can we do a side story on this very topic? Yes. There is an absolutely wonderful expat Chicago writer, Alan Heathcock. I mean, he is, he's a powerhouse. He lives in Boise now, or as they say there, Boise. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know him. I'm really, now I do, but I didn't then. I wanted him to be on my podcast, but I was embarrassed to ask him. His debut short story collection, Volt, is phenomenal. But I knew he lived in Boise and I called him. I just cold called him. I said, hey, we kind of know each other. Maybe you want to get a drink? I'm, I was there for work. I was okay. doing some gig, not literary. I was there for a gig. I was keynoting something. Oh, there's a humble brag. Sorry, I was at a conference in Boise. So he's like, hey, man, let's meet. So he's like, can I take you to you know the bar I hang out in? Like He was really cool. I found him a little intimidating. So if he's listening to, dude, you were awesome. Now we're friends. But So we go out to his bar, uh, the place he hangs out, this tiny little coal in the wall bar, though very nice. And he's like, I got to show you something. And on the menu under craft drinks is the Heathcock. <laughs> so he spent so much time in this bar and the bartender loved him so much that they named a drink after him. Wow. And even though my mother later told me I should aspire to greater things, in that moment, I thought there is nothing I aspire to more than someone one day naming a drink after me in their bar. And so I looked at Alan Heathcock. I said, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. He said, like any true Chicagoan, and this would have been about 10, 15 years ago, he said, I was watching Oprah, and she said, if you want something, you have to wish it into existence. He mm-hmm. says, and so I started saying, someone has to name a drink after me, and now they have. He goes, that's all you need to do. I think it's more complicated, because I've been trying to manifest that for the last 10 or 15 years, yeah. and no named a drink. But I don't even remember what's in the Heathcock, but that was really something. And by the way... It was the first bar I was ever in where they did those enormous, where they do the one enormous ice cube. Yeah. I don't even know if that means less drinking for people, but the first time I saw the enormous cocktail ice cube, I thought, this is a wonderful, I mean, it's only frozen water, but I was very taken with that. Yeah. That's fantastic. It was. Oh, it was. It made me very happy. Yeah. I, well, so a lot of Pilcro events happened at the bar Matilda. Yes. And that was because my friend Dave Couston, I was, I had moved to Edgewater. I was feeling very like untethered. Mm. And he was like, Leah, you just got to pick a bar and decide you're going to become a regular and just do it. And they had like a, a wine night where it was like, you know, $7 glasses or half price bottles of wine. They had this red wine I adored, like this pasta dish. It was just so simple. It was penne pasta, garlic, spinach, and like grilled chicken, and maybe, maybe cherry tomatoes. So basic, so amazing. Chocolate chip wontons. So deep fried, like wontons with chocolate chip cookie dough in them, deep fried. And the bartender, William, and I became like very good friends. And So we did, I did a number, I did at least one birthday party there, maybe a couple. I did synagogue events there. We did Pilcro. I was there the night Obama was elected and we like, they passed out a champagne toast for everyone. And we did a countdown when California was going to, polls were closing in California. Like there's something special about being a regular and I miss it. Like, I don't have that. Now you're you're making me realize that there are some false steps I've taken the last 10, 15 years. I've said to Debbie, if we ever move out of the neighborhood that we're in, we need to be in a neighborhood where there's a good diner where we can be regulars, a good Mm -hmm. coffee shop, and a good bar. So I hear you. I think being a regular somewhere, which again, I have failed to achieve, is a really, again, maybe, you know, a low bar as far as aspirations, but you've only reminded me that that seems like a big deal. And that's a great bar, by the way, to be a regular in. Yeah, I miss it. I don't, I mean, life goes on. Yes. A lot of the staff that I knew moved away. So I got charged for more drinks. And I was like, oh, it's not as affordable when half my drinks aren't free. (laughs) Yeah, it does become a little less fun when you have to pay for everything. Yeah. But I picked it because I could get off the train at Belmont. People would meet me there. I would just put up a tweet like going to Matilda's tonight. This was like peak fun Chicago Twitter. 
And people would just meet me there. And I didn't know who was going to show up. It was such a fun time. You know, this will not be the first time you and I have spoken where I'm thinking, I need to rethink my whole life now. So <laughs> I understand this is your show, and I hope I brought the goods, but you have profoundly impacted me on a variety of levels, and I'm super excited. The most recent being, I need a bar to hang out in, even if yeah. I don't drink like I used to. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Ben, is there anything else about Jen or Basketball Diaries that you haven't said that you'd be sad to leave unsaid? That's an awesome question. And I'd love to come up with something profound and or witty, but I don't think so. You know, okay. it's funny, like other, like we talked about a little while ago, I'm not someone who pushes that which brings me pleasure. It seems like a zero-sum game. I am thrilled, though, however, that you were so excited about those topics. I know that's an underlying element of this show, but you tapped into the thing that I do know about myself. When I meet yeah. people who like the things I like, I mean, we were already friends and I already hold you at the highest regard slash adoration. And yet your excitement about the things that excite me only then make me further excited. So again, like many other people, we will be stuck together as long as you can bear it. You'll have to walk away. It won't be. That's what I want to say. <laughs> I and don't plan on walking you. away from you, Ben. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I, I, you know, I have um, abandonment issues, but I really appreciate this. And, you know, I think you can also appreciate what I'm about to say because of your the business I always associate with you, which is I haven't had a book come out in a while. That is no great loss for anybody or even myself. But one of the exciting things, I know some people complain about this and I totally appreciate it. No judgment. I enjoy this part about it a lot. Yeah. So when you say, oh, you've got a book, you should come on the show. And a couple of other people have done that. And I might have pitched them anyway. I might have chased after you if you asked me to. Like, that's cool. That's the part I enjoy. I enjoy that also. But this is really great. We're talking about gin and books and the book is coming out. And we can do that anyway. Yeah. But it has a reason behind it. And there's something, you know, a little exciting about that. So I also appreciate you allowing me to feel that because that's a good place to be. You know, I love it. Yeah, it's a great place to be as you as your publicity machine begins. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We are machine like and it's wonderful. So the missing, we will link to pre-sale in the show notes available on the first day of spring, March 21st. Oh, wonderful. It is a book. Of, well, it's not a book about rebirth, but it could be if that's if you want it to be. Yeah. Ben, where can people find you online? Well, thank you for asking. You can find me at tanzerben.com and I will be happy to spend hours Talk about how I gave up the Ben Tanzer domain name when I never thought I'd have a website because that's how far back people like you and I go. Mm -hmm. and as soon as I let it lapse, someone bought it immediately. However, I won't belabor that. This is the end of the show. So TanzerBen.com is the mothership. I hope everybody has a good mothership. And then you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I do all the socials and much to my children's chagrin, given this long break between books, I believe I'm going to start a book talk soon. So awesome. I'm going to say, I'm going to take a chance. Look for me on TikTok. Well, you'll find Lee. Lee's on, I see Lee on Book Talk. Right. And we love Lee. Lee, we love you. So if Lee's on the Book Talk, maybe that's reason enough to be there just to have more chances to interact with him. Yeah. And so when is the event? You've got March 21st, Exile in Bookville. So I think that, so sorry, I probably said that poorly earlier. The release date of the book is Thursday, March 21st. And then on Friday, March 22nd, I will be at Exile in Bookville with, I should say, David Masiotra, a terrific Chicago writer. We're both going to do our releases together that night. That Sunday, I'll be at Sunday Salon, which I'm super excited about. Nice. We'll be at the Bookseller in April. I'm sorry, Bookseller people, the date. I'm not great with dates, so it is in April. I know that. We're also going to be at Literati in Ann Arbor that same week. Lee and nice. I, Lee and I are doing a little mini tour together. Very fun. We are going to lit you out like crazy. And then I'm doing my other little mini tour where we're going to go New York, Philly, L.A. So that's P&T Knitwear, April 10th in New York City, then the 11th at a novel ID in Philly, and then the 13th in L.A., Culver City at the Village Well. So, yeah, no, we're taking some swings for sure. Nice. Thank you for asking. That is Amy Guth's birthday, and she is currently living in L.A. So, okay, just... Let's go full circle on the Amy Goo thing. Yeah, so I didn't know she lived in L.A., and apparently she did it kind of quietly. And so I literally was stumbled on that like on LinkedIn the other day. So I sent her a note, and I said, are you in L.A.? And she said, yes. 
And I said, are you around on the 13th? I have a book thing. I'd love to see you. She, who, by the way, invited me to my first book reading ever mm. at that coffee shop down the street. The from Fix. The what was it called? It was called The Fix. That was The Fix. Mm-hmm. I, can I just say, I don't know how Amy found me. I am forever indebted. She brought in me, Eric Spitznagel, yeah. and Megan Steelstra. And I was in so over my head with those three. But uh, anyway, I texted the gooth. Always be the gooth to me. And she's like, that's my birthday and I will come out for the reading. So I'm going to get to see her on her birthday. A little tiny here at the end. Yeah, I didn't know that was her birthday either. She's a queen. She, well, you both are. But man, she really hooked me up in the early days. And uh, I am endlessly appreciative. Yeah, she is quite the connector. Big time. Well, you can find Finding Favorites on Instagram, mainly just Instagram, Finding Faves Pod, Faves, F-A-V-S, no E. Rate and review five stars, please, on Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, or Spotify. Finding Favorites is edited and engineered by Rob Abrazado. And keep enjoying your favorite things. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.